Another subject that's getting some attention this week is what I'm now told is de-dollarization. The world's largest oil producer, Saudi Arabia, is reportedly asking to join BRICS. Yes, it is true, the United States also makes money by printing money. You know, as much as I would like to do something with the Fed, I say the Fed's going to self-destruct eventually anyway when the money, when the money's gone. A uh, major development in the banking world, the FDIC just reported that California regulators shut down Silicon Valley Bank. It's six months till the recession. And in that six month period, we're basically, we're in purgatory. We don't know, we don't, we don't know where we are. We're just asking questions, where's the recession? Federal Reserve announcing its decision on interest rates now. The Fed will raise rates by a quarter of a percent in line with what analysts were expecting. Let's talk a little bit about this because you've got a pretty um, stark concern about what's happening with the economy right now. You think we could be in full-fledged recession by the end of this year. Here in New York, everything seems normal. There's a sense of constant movement, a rhythm that seems to keep the city alive. Today is a day like any other, or is it? Some say de-dollarization is not only happening, but could be accelerating. Right now, one of the things that has me um, the most unnerved is the attack on the dollar. Look, it goes beyond these things that just today, today, Brazil, in our hemisphere, largest country in the Western Hemisphere, south of us, cut a trade deal with China. They're going to, from now on, do trade in their own currencies, get right around the dollar. They're creating a, a secondary economy in the world, totally independent of the United States. Experts continue to claim the dollar is dead. But is there evidence? Or is it merely just speculation? The symbol of economic power and the reserve currency of the world. Could it be on the brink of losing its supremacy? What U.S. did in terms of sanctions uh, against Russia, that a lot of countries, whether it's China, it's India, they're all trying to diversify, get off the dollar standard. This isn't a story of mere numbers and data, but of power, prestige, and a potential shift that could redraw the economic map of the entire world. This is the story of the currency that was too big to fail. Wages are up, but so are prices for food and gas. Exports are rising, but the housing market has declined. At kitchen tables across our country, there is a concern about our economic future. In the long run, Americans can be confident about our economic growth. As the year 2008 dawned on the United States, an era of prosperity seemed to be at its peak. Day for the history books, the stock market on a rocket ride, blasting through a ceiling and closing at an all-time high. The stock market was booming, the economy was growing, and the American dream seemed to be alive and well. But beneath this shimmering facade, the tectonic plates of the economy were beginning to shift. The signs were everywhere, but now it's official we are in a recession. The housing market, once a rock-solid pillar of the American dream, was bloated by years of speculative buying and reckless lending. One across the street and two more at the end, so half of the homes on this cul-de-sac have been hit with a foreclosure situation. Now the bad news is that the half that haven't been hit yet will be in the near future. Meanwhile, Wall Street was playing a risky game. Complex financial instruments, known as derivatives, were being traded in shadowy corners of the finance world. Unbeknownst to many, these were the early tremors of an economic earthquake that would soon shake the world to its core. Credit markets have frozen, and families and businesses have found it harder to borrow money. 
We are in the midst of a serious financial crisis, and the federal government is responding with decisive action. As 2008 progressed, the cracks in the economy began to widen. For Wall Street, it was another case of whiplash. The markets haven't been this volatile in almost 80 years. For the past 50 days, the S&P 500 has whipsawed up and down an average of nearly 4% every day. That hasn't happened since the late 1920s. Banks and insurance companies found themselves staring into an abyss. By March, Bear Stearns, a prestigious investment bank, teetered on the brink of bankruptcy. Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Closing Bell. I'm Maria Bartiromo today in London. The rescue of Bear Stearns dominating the entire trading day on Wall Street. The Federal Reserve, under the leadership of Chairman Ben Bernanke, began to take unprecedented action. Bear Stearns shareholders have approved J.P. Morgan Chase's $2.2 billion buyout of the investment bank. Since offering to take over the firm two and a half months ago at the behest of the U.S. government, the deal's approval comes as no surprise. Analysts say it has helped to calm the markets. This news raised difficult questions of public policy. Normally, the market sorts out which companies survive and which fail, and that is as it should be. However, the issues raised here extended well beyond the fate of one company. But this was only the tip of the iceberg, and by September, the crisis was showing no signs of stopping. Lehman Brothers is going bankrupt, and financial markets from Asia to Europe are doing their utmost to prevent Monday from turning from dark to black. Employees of America's fourth largest investment bank saw the writing on the wall late Sunday after talks to pull them back from the abyss collapsed. Excuse me, sir, how, how are you feeling? <laughs> how do you think? <laughs> In response, Bernanke and head of the Treasury, Henry Paulson, knew they had to act fast. A short time ago, the House of Representatives passed a bill that is essential to helping America's economy weather the financial crisis. The Senate passed the same legislation on Wednesday night. When Congress sends me the final bill, I'm going to sign it into law. But at the same time, the Federal Reserve was beginning to embark on a brand new policy. Something that would forever change the role of central banks. Quantitative easing. Quantitative easing. Quantitative easing involves the creation of new money, not the literal printing of money as used to occur, but the creation of money with a click of a computer mouse. The dollar, the emerging markets, the exit strategy, the inflationary expectations, do the risks outweigh the benefits? That's the core question, really. As the Fed began to implement QE, what it became was something of its own. Uh, yes, when, the, when all this money gets flooding, flooded out of the central bank, of course it's going to help the people who get it. Stocks are going to do well, bonds are going to do well, some people are going to do very well, but it's not the way to revive the economy. Printing money has never been a, a way to long-term success. I have a, a silver ounce here, and this, this ounce of, uh, of silver back in 2006 would buy over four gallons of gasoline. Today, today it'll buy almost 11 gallons of gasoline. That's preservation of value, and that's what, that's what the market has always said should be money. M money comes into effect in a natural way, not in an edict, not by fiat, by governments declaring it, it, is, it is money. Today, the effects of QE are still reverberating throughout the economy. National debt remains at staggering heights with the government paying over $1 billion a day on interest repayments alone. We're uh, $33 trillion in the hole uh, and climbing. Uh, what impact is that among, in addition to Social Security, Medicare costs that have to be funded in the near future, in the next couple of years? How is that going to impact the economy and portfolio structures? In 2007, the Federal Reserve maintained a balance sheet of less than $1 trillion. But today, that number stands at a staggering $8.5 trillion. An increase that can trace much of its roots back to 2008. 
leaving many left to wonder when the next financial bubble will burst and just how severe the repercussions will be. Are we in a debt crisis or are we headed for one? Um, we are at the, in my opinion, we are at the beginning of a very classic late cycle, late big cycle debt crisis when the supply demand gap, when you're producing too much, too much debt and you have also a shortage of buyers. What's happening now as we have to sell all this uh, debt is we then have, do you have enough buyers? There are changes now in terms of the quantities in the world that are being held by um, large investors around the world that have lost money in these treasury bonds and so on. And then there are geopolitical changes which are having an effect. The value of the dollar and its status as the world's reserve currency now hangs in the balance as well. People can't get out of the way of what they don't see coming. Uh, to me, this is a very, very big deal. And at the, at the same time, we have a record 17.1 trillion in household debt, 12 trillion record in mortgages, record 11.6 trillion in auto loans, 1.6 trillion in student debt, which by the way, is the US government's largest asset and one trillion in credit card debt. So at a time when people don't see what's coming, they are not in position to be able to weather this storm that is bearing down upon us. To the person who is about to grab their car keys and go to the ATM and take out $3,000, you say what? You don't need to. Your ATM is safe, your banks are safe, there's enough cash in the financial system, and there is an infinite amount of cash at the Federal Reserve. We will do whatever we need to do to make sure that there's enough cash in the banking system. Robert Kiyosaki is one of the most well-known entrepreneurs in America. Best known for his financial self-help books, he's managed to amass over a hundred million dollar fortune. But recently, Kiyosaki has turned his focus on something else. So when the dollar crashes, I get richer. Right. <laughs> and that happens time and time again. That's going to happen now. When do you think it will happen? It's happening right now. America. America is sliding into a depression right now. And I said, it's Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. But it's Russia, China versus America right now. It's the biggest battle in history going on today. And the dollar is going to lose. Known as BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, Kiyosaki believes the alliance is working on something that could change the world forever. The possibility or the what you think is coming is the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, possibly Japan and Mexico are going to say, we're going to shift to a gold back you want. And our quest, my question to us all over the world, what does that mean to the dollar? Speculated to be backed by gold, a BRICS currency seems to be on the horizon. And many, including Kiyosaki, believe a BRICS currency could redefine the global financial landscape. It's just like, you know, the U.S. has been the big bully in the, uh, in the play yard. Suddenly all the other kids are saying, well, you're not going to be the bully anymore. We're going to gang up on you. That's what the BRICS are. They said, hey, we're going to take you down, bully. The whisperings of a currency reform have grown louder in recent years, questioning the conventional dominance that the West has had for so long. Each of the BRICS nations has started to chip away at their dependence on the dollar. Their methods vary, but the momentum is undeniable. In the last year, Russia, China, and Brazil have increased their use of non-dollar currencies. Simultaneously, nations like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are actively exploring alternatives to the dollar, while countries like Iraq have banned the use of it entirely. Countries across the world are ditching the US dollar. Tonight, we want to tell you about how it's playing out in West Asia. Iraq has become the latest country to dump the US dollar. Iraqis are now banned from dealing in the greenback. As these initiatives evolve, central banks are also shifting their reserves 
away from the dollar and towards more stable assets like gold. I think when it comes to demand, um, the big focus really here is investors. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world, be it geopolitical or macroeconomic, and certainly we've seen a flight to quality i.e. a flight to gold in recent months. And that's a trend which we foresee continuing as we go throughout the year. Russian officials are an advocate for moving away from the dollar for the wounds inflicted by sanctions. The Russian banking system, excluded from SWIFT and faced with frozen reserves, has found an unlikely ally in de-dollarization. China has also been vocal about its concerns, terming the dollar's dominance as a source of instability and uncertainty in the world economy. The expansion is historic, reflecting the resolution of the BRICS countries to unite and cooperate with other developing countries, meeting the expectation of the international community and serves the common interests of emerging markets and developing countries. But opinions among experts in the United States vary greatly. While Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has expressed faith in the dollar, some see a viable path for a BRICS currency to usurp the dollar's throne. When they issue a gold-backed currency and use the distributed ledger technology that the Chinese have mastered over four or five years with their digital yuan. Distributed ledger technology is also known blockchain. as blockchain. That's blockchain. right. So you show what every country that has signed up for the BRICS is going to peg to the, to the blockchain. You now have trust, and in other words, trust is not in our past, it's not in our words, it's not in any of this. A potential introduction of a new currency from the BRICS nations marks a pivotal point in their alliance. But what it also represents is a much larger movement to chip away at the dollar's foothold in global financial markets. And with countries like Saudi Arabia vying to join the alliance, the threat to the dollar is becoming more real every day. Forget new allies. Even old friends of the West are ditching it, like Saudi Arabia. First, it refused to ramp up oil production for the European Union. And now, it wants to be a part of BRICS, a block of five major emerging economies, including China and Russia. Trading its oil in dollars, Saudi Arabia has been a key point of strength for the U.S. over the last 50 years. But with its application into BRICS, the Saudi Kingdom is beginning to shift away from the West. We have decided to invite the Argentine Republic, the Arab Republic of Egypt, the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. They, we don't know what's really going to unfold, but part of their plan is perhaps a reserve currency backed by gold. Your thoughts, is this just, you know, talk or action that we might see? I think there's a bigger story to tell about the BRICS. It's almost three quarters of the world's population have signed on. So there was only the, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. But the big one is Saudi Arabia and Iran. We, we need to be global partners in upholding global justice. We need to strengthen strategic collaboration, practice true multilateralism, and promote the expansion of the representation and voice of southern countries in global governance. South Africa and China have similar views with regard to the expansion of BRICS membership and we look forward to the discussions that we are going to have with other BRICS leaders. How important is China? Because we've seen China really exerting its influence as a regional power, you know, um, and we've certainly seen it becoming a much more influential force, not just in the Middle East, but Africa and other parts of the world. So is this really um, is China driving this expansion? And also this point, that the fact that you, know, you have China and Russia at loggerheads, rising tensions with the United States and the West. And now BRICS is, is to add countries to its team that are openly antagonistic to the West, like Iran. This is just basically becoming an anti-Western bloc, isn't it? 
You know, all of a sudden you got everyone talking about this, including Fox and CNN. And a lot of the commentators in our space who weren't talking about it now are. That's true. And I'm, I'm happy for that. But what they're all missing is what happens when the switch is flipped. I think the United States can rest assured that the dollar is going to play the dominant role in international uh, transactions, facilitating international transactions and um, serving as a reserve currency in the years ahead. In your bank account, the Federal Reserve announcing it has gone live with its new FedNow instant payment system, a system that should allow households and businesses to send payments and receive money immediately. The United States Federal Reserve is considering the creation of a digital dollar. In a digital world where the unthinkable is often surpassed, a beguiling question has been forming. Could the U.S. dollar the financial bedrock of the global economy be losing its cornerstone status. More and more of the world's trade, more and more of the world's investment, more and more of the reserves held by central banks around the world are held no longer in dollars, but in gold and other currencies. Unbeknownst to many, the answer might be lurking in lines of cryptographic code. Despite the sound of the word, there's not just one blockchain. Blockchain is shorthand for a whole suite of distributed ledger technologies that can be programmed to record and track anything of value, from financial transactions to medical records or even land titles. Initially dismissed as a foundation for the world of cryptocurrencies, blockchain's potential reach is far more transformative. Blockchain's allure lies in its capacity for decentralization, with decentralized finance platforms having grown exponentially over the past few years, one can lend, borrow, and trade assets without converting them into a globally dominant currency. It's in a world where you could make trades, deposit into a savings account, or buy insurance, all without ever going through an intermediary like a bank. That's the promise of DeFi. As blockchain becomes the backbone of a new financial landscape, central bank digital currencies are the flesh and blood. CBDC is a central bank digital currency. So it's a virtual currency that is backed and issued by a central bank. So it is backed by the full faith and credit of the US government. So I want you to know that CBDCs are not the same thing as stable coins. So the most popular, the more popular ones, USDT, USDC, those are cryptocurrencies that are issued by private enterprise and they're pegged to something else. And of course, a CBDC is nothing like Bitcoin because Bitcoin is decentralized. A CBDC is, I mean, that, that's as centralized as you can get. That is, a CBDC is state issued and operated. This is on CBDC in particular for the use of general, to the general use. Uh, we tend to establish the equivalence with cash uh, and there is a huge difference there. Uh, for example, in cash, uh, we don't know, for example, who is using a $100 bill today. We don't know who is using a 1,000 peso bill today. Uh, the, a key difference in, with the CBDC is that central bank will have absolute control on the rules and regulations that will determine the use of that uh, expression of central bank liability and also we will have the technology to enforce that. Far from being a theoretical venture, the development of CBDCs is a worldwide pursuit. An astonishing 98% of the global economy, represented by over 130 countries, is actively working on or considering the adoption of a central bank digital currency. The Chinese last month unveiled the world's first digital currency from a major power. Currency that would not be printed, but would exist only in cyberspace on your phone, for example. Is the Fed working on a digital dollar? We are actually evaluating that. Most um, major countries uh, are now looking at, at the possibility of having a digital currency and really asking the question. And even more startling, over half these nations are at advanced stages of development. 
where the development of central bank digital currencies is, is proceeding. And there are a few interesting developments here. So there are basically two use cases for central bank digital currencies. One is to sort of make payments more efficient within a country itself. But the other one, and the one that I personally think is more interesting, is the use of CBDCs cross border. And basically what that means is like, you know, other countries using a CBDC to transact am among themselves. And the reason why this is interesting is that at least theoretically, this could challenge the dominance of the US dollar. China's central bank has started distributing the e-renminbi, an entirely digital version of the country's paper money that can be used and accepted by businesses and customers even without an internet connection credit, or even a bank account. Comparatively, the U.S. is struggling to finish its lengthy investigation into the viability of an e-dollar. In fact, the Federal Reserve will not take a position on whether the U.S. Central Bank should or will create a digital currency. Uh, you know, potentially a U.S. CBDC would have a wider view. I do want to stress we have not decided to do it, but we do understand our obligation is to, is to really get to to the bottom and understand both the uh, technical and the um, policy issues that, that uh, need to be answered. The United States, once at the forefront of technological advancement and digital payments, is now being surpassed by both its main international rival and a large portion of the developed and developing countries. Many experts believe leadership in this space will have implications for more than just payments, geopolitical ambitions, economic growth, financial inclusion, and the very nature of money could all be dictated by who leads the charge and how they will do it. China is actually very much um, driving, I think, a lot of the agenda around central bank digital currency. Yet even as CBDCs do promise a new dawn, they cast shadows of uncertainty as well. One major hurdle being public perception and trust. Physical money has been called one of the last bastions of privacy. Laws like the Bank Secrecy Act have already stripped away most of the privacy from bank accounts and financial transactions. Banks have really a ton of power that people don't realize to shut down accounts, to freeze accounts, and to end up holding them for really any number of reasons. If I buy anything, the government doesn't know it. MasterCard kind of knows it, but even MasterCard uses product codes. So they don't say, you know, Jim bought a Snickers. It says Jim bought miscellaneous merchandise at a retail place. So the government doesn't know what you're doing. But with this new central bank digital currency, they will because they maintain the ledger. Security concerns such as fraud and digital theft continue to present formidable challenges as well. The role of blockchain and CBDCs may still be in its infancy, but it would be naive to ignore their disruptive potential. In the middle of this shift, the US dollar finds itself at a precarious juncture. Its reign as the uncontested global reserve currency, challenged by a quiet but relentless digital revolution. Uh, for the people who work numbers, I am giving you free advice that those of you who are holding dollars, you surely might go into losses. You better, you better uh, do what you must do because uh, this market is going to be different in a couple of weeks. With private companies pushing deeper into the digital currency space, rival countries seeking to seize leadership, and a public that is moving further away from physical currency, the US is facing a world in which it may not control or even lead the world's payment systems. There are definitely people out there who fear that this China's central bank digital currency is being used to challenge the supremacy of the U.S. dollar because the U.S. dollar right now is the world's most powerful currency. It can be used for many different things, for example, sanctions. And having a Chinese central bank digital currency circulating all over the world could be one way of undermining the power of the U.S. dollar.